Hi, I'm Eric Ford for Made Here. The Champlain College Student Showcase is a yearly look at current work from students in the broadcast, media production, and filmmaking programs at the college. The 2022 showcase features four films, a documentary about media freedom in Gambia from students studying abroad in Africa, a doc profiling new Vermonter-owned businesses, an experimental film based on a poem, and a short fiction film from students abroad in Dublin. You can watch the Champlain College Student Showcase and other great Made Here films streaming on vermontpublic.org and through the PBS app. Enjoy the films, and thanks for watching. September 15th. I didn't sleep again last night. I think it's gotten worse. I heard every creak and snore from everyone else in the house. I saw everything but the insides of my eyelids. I tried to get some work done during class today, but I ended up passing out on my desk. I can't remember much else from class. The days are just blending together at this point. It can't really help that I'm so restless though, or that I'm bored during the day. Hello. Did someone... Did someone drop this? What? Who doesn't write the name on the inside? January 1st. Happy New Year. This diary was gifted to me by my mother. She wants to have a way to express myself, which doesn't sound like a bad idea, considering. So, it's my New Year's resolution to write here at least once a month. In an attempt to connect to someone or something, and instead of writing Dear Diary, I thought I'd write to you, Dublin. I know it sounds cheesy, but I'm not sure who to write to otherwise. Telling everything to one specific person seems daunting, so, Dear Dublin. You are so cold, at least at this time of year. I wanted to at least see some other people, but I'm still scared, so I just sat in Ivy Gardens for a few minutes. I got up and started wandering around when I realized that I'd freeze to death if I just sat there any longer. 
There's hardly anyone out today, which could have something to do with hangovers from last night, but it makes me wonder why I'm out here. February 24th. Dear Dublin, my friend Aoife, who I've known since primary school, took me to a show last night at the National Concert Hall. I think she felt a little bad for me. I haven't gone out to do anything in about two months. It was just the two of us. I wonder if she missed me. Or maybe she just didn't want to overwhelm me with a huge group of friends. Either way, it was nice. We didn't even have to say anything. Not that we could, being at a show and all. It's funny, I don't think I've ever spent any time one-on-one -on -one like that. There were a lot of things I never noticed about her. I've known her for so long, but it's only since last night that I've started to see her differently. As I write this, I'm realising that I have a crush on my childhood friend. I'm lost, Dublin. Where do we go from here? March 2nd. Dear Dublin, I went to Mass with my mother today for the first time in about a year. I used to go there every Sunday when I was little, until my accident in December. I stopped going after that. I didn't, well, don't see much point in going anymore. I felt so disconnected since. Especially all the singing and call and responses. It was just as isolating as I thought it would be. I think my throat's still swollen from surgery. It doesn't even hurt anymore. There's no scar either. But I feel like there's a scar there. That only I can see. That you don't see, Dublin. April 8th. Dear Dublin. I saw Aoife again today. We've hung out a lot since that initial show. You know when something finally clicked in my brain and her dark brown eyes became the brightest things I've ever seen and her smile turned into the widest, prettiest smile I've ever seen someone wear? We started to talk more instead of just sitting in the dark in a theatre staring at a stage full of talented strangers. We went for a walk around some quiet streets today. She's caught on to the fact that it's easy for me to get distracted or annoyed when there's a ton of people around. You've gotten warmer, Dublin. Is that a sign? May 12th. Dear Dublin, there's a saying that claims if you have cold hands, then you have a warm heart. Does it work the other way too? Can something look like a good sign until you look deeper? Because you've gotten warmer, Dublin. But you've not been kind to me. I've taken a step backward from my socialising progress and retreated to the bookshop I used to spend a lot of my time in. I always like to hide in the back corner with all the old books that no one bothers to look at. I sometimes wish that someone did come back. Apparently, my wish came true today. Aoife came in, which would normally brighten my day. But I felt something different today. She came in with a guy I've never seen before. I've known her all my life, yet I've never seen this guy. As soon as I saw their fingers laced together, I knew it was over. I managed to sneak out without her seeing me. I'm not sure if that was the right thing to do, or if she was really with him or not, but I'm not sure if she ever truly liked me either. I wish I could have said something to her. I wish you were bigger, Dublin so I wouldn't have had to see her. June 25th. Dear Dublin. I went to Grafton Street today. One of the few places I love to go, even though it's crowded and full of tourists. I just love all the musicians there. My mother used to take me down there quite a bit on the weekends. We used to find a bench or just sit on the curb and people watch. Sometimes we'd grab a bite to eat. We don't go there too much anymore since I moved out, so I decided to just take myself there today. It's always a little sad or awkward to see someone sitting or eating alone, but at the same time, it was peaceful. I guess I'd rather just people watch than actually be around anyone. It gave me a lot of time to think, mostly about those nice times when I was little and walking around Grafton Street in Stevens Green with Mum. July 17th. Dear Dublin. I drove my sister to the airport today. She's leaving for America for a new job. It's not that she doesn't like you, Dublin. She's going to be an ambassador over there, which I'm still having a hard time grasping. She's just my little sister. How could she be a big shot ambassador, you know? Well, good luck to her. Fair play, Bridget. I'll definitely miss her. Won't you, Dublin? August 10th. Dear Dublin, I tried to go to Mass again. My mother couldn't come with me this time, which is surprising considering how religious she is. I always thought I'd take an army to stop her. Apparently, it takes a disease. Her doctor recommended that she not strain herself too much, even if it's just walking down to Mass. I went to check on her today. 
You wouldn't even know she was sick by the tone of her voice and her giddy personality. She's so pale, though. I'm worried about her, but she manages to keep her spirits up. I can't help but think about what might happen soon. I ended up just wandering around the graveyard instead of going to Mass. I bet she'll be buried here. I'm so sorry. September 15th. Dear Dublin, this might be my final entry. What? You, you can't just stop. How am I meant to find you? I know I was supposed to write here at least once a month for the whole year, but I don't think it's helping. I haven't felt more connected to anyone, or even to you, Dublin, since the start of this mission. If anything, I've gotten more isolated. I sit alone in the quietest parts of the city just writing, not even talking to anyone, not even seeing anyone. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It was just lying on the ground over there. I, I wasn't going to read it, but then when I saw that there was no name on the inside, I just started reading, and then... I'm so sorry. I know that there was personal stuff in there, so I just didn't want to just leave it on the ground. Like, at least you have it back now. I really hope I didn't find it. Oh. You're left. So you can hear me, but you can't respond. Your entries make more sense then. I get it. Oh, not that I get how it understands to feel to be mute, but I mean, I can sort of understand where you're coming from. Um, I keep a diary too. I get anxious and frustrated to you. I, I have some experience with what you write about. Like, um, September 5th, didn't sleep. I was up all night worrying about how I might have been rude to a barista yesterday. I can't stand the thought of someone talking about me and about how rude I was behind my back. I hate the thought of making people's lives harder, you know? September 7th. I got stood up by my friend tonight. We were supposed to see a movie together, but she never showed up. I assume because she's with that new guy. I ended up watching half of it by myself before I left. I'm so sick of being stepped all over. September 13th. I've been away at university for a couple of weeks now. I'm starting my first year. I already kind of miss my family. I'm not so used to being away for so long. I miss the adventures we used to go on together on the weekends. I miss being taken care of. Now we're even. I'm sorry that I read it. Your diary. Well, then, in that case, you're welcome. <laughs> oh, I'm Cara, by the way. I knew everyone said my name.
you know, you should really write that on the front. See? That's a one way to do people. Just start leaving it around the place and hope nothing mind you. <laughs> oh god. To go. Um Do you maybe want to meet up again sometime? <laughs> um to your coffee same same here, same time next week. Sorry for doubting you. You do bring good things and people, after all. With love, Declan. As you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Lace Dragonians, Cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way, as long as you keep your thoughts race high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lace Dragonians, Cyclops, Wild Poseidon, You won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul. Unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope your road is a long one. 
May there be many summer mornings when, with what pleasure, what joy, you enter harbors you're seeing for the first time. You may stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. And you may visit many Egyptian cities to learn and to go on learning from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for, but don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years, so you're old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey, Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you'll have understood by then what these Ithacas mean. Son, Remember life is a gift. Cherish each step. Goodbye and remember, I'm always here, guiding you. Ahmed Omar is cooking his famous Philly steak sandwich, but this isn't your average cheesesteak. Omar infuses each of his dishes with a unique Somali twist. I want to make sure that, oh, I had a Philly in other places, but when I come to Kismayo, this is the best Philly I've ever had. 
And you can find these special dishes at his restaurant, Kismayo Kitchen, the only source of Somali cuisine in Vermont. For Omar, it's been a long journey to Kismayo Kitchen. He was born in Kismayo, Somalia, where he and his family were forced to flee due to the Civil War. I left there when I was young, when I was a little kid, because of the Civil War. And, um, you know, uh, we got, um, when the war happened, you know, one of our family get killed and, and uh, we decided, you know, to get out of there. It was bad. People are coming to your house. When the Civil War happened, people are coming to your house because there was no job, there was no income, everybody, and, you know, people are breaking houses, stealing your money, uh, killing you, uh, raping a woman, and it was bad. Omar and his family fled to Kenya as refugees then came to the United States in 2004 when he was 16. Along with some of his family members, Omar was placed in Vermont and graduated from Burlington High School in 2006. When I came here, my first job was McDonald's. I'm like, wow, these people love food. These people enjoying it. And that what makes me come. My mom is a chef. So I got most of the ideas, most of this. So I was like, mom, you gotta show me this. I can cook for you tomorrow. And I start falling in love with it. I feel when I came here, I was like, okay, this city needs me. This city needs my recipe. The secret ingredient is always love. You gotta have that love. Like I, I, like, to come, I like to come to my customer, talk to them, ask how's their day as. I'm not gonna put my sandwich and put it there and get, get my money like I don't know you. No, we don't do that. Like, I cook for you a nice meal. I talk to you, how you feeling? I grab you a glass of water, you tired, you know. Omar says that finding success was no easy feat, but his background prepared him for the hardships of being a business owner. Life is tough, bro. You gotta learn how to survive. You gotta learn how to adapt it. I know my father, if he was here today, I wish he was here, but never happened. But what I'm gonna do, sit down and cry? No, you gotta, man, you gotta find how to hunt. You gotta find a way. There's always exit, but you gotta work hard for it. Nothing comes easy. Uh, when you open a restaurant, it's not easy. That's one of the hardest jobs in the world. And when you open the business, you cannot start paying people right away because you, you don't know if you're gonna make money. Very good. Uh, I'm blessed. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, toughness, but you know, like uh, it was upside and down, but I'm very blessed that I have amazing community get my back. It isn't just his food that brings his customers back. His attitude and dedication to serving a good meal leaves diners feeling like a part of Omar's family. It's not fatty, not greasy. You can eat this and you, in a couple hours later you might need another one. I like to taste it to make it fresh. Before we make the ingredients, we want to make sure that is this amazing? Yes, then I'll put it in the menu. In the quiet town of St. George, Vermont, Miriam counter manages all operations of her home-based business, Matryoshka's Bakery. Miriam's specialty is French macarons, not to be confused with macaroons. The main ingredient in macarons is almond flour, which gives the pastry its fluffy, smooth texture. Pretty much ready, and we have water. We have, we're making Italian meringue. From Russia, Miriam was 21 when she first came to Vermont through an international work program. One reason she came, to brush up on her English. My dad always like kind of pushed me with English, like that I need to learn, you know, better. And I want to kind of improve my language here. It was a great opportunity for us to exercise our language, to work, to make money, and to meet friends, and to learn about the culture too. My goal was to be able, I think I was, when the first year I came, it was like, could I, or am I going to be able to think in English, you know, dream in English? And like, after all those years, I think definitely being, me, having friends, you know, and television and husband and all that helped. With all her family back in Russia, Miriam made the tough decision to stay in the States. It was my second year and um, I met, I met my husband. We thought that I must, maybe I, I'll try to, you know, extend my visa and to see if um, I can travel or go to school here. It didn't happen because we got married. So, um, but 
you know, um, I'm happy with the decision definitely that I made. Miriam's adjustment was gradual. Living in the States since 2005, she's adapted to American culture, but Miriam seldom gets to visit her family in Russia. She misses certain family traditions, so she keeps some of them alive at home. We have in the back there some of our that are on the table. It's a Russian like a teapot and uh, like I've always wanted to have it in our home because it was like something that my grandpa had. Like my grandpa would be always sitting at the like head of the table and anyone who walked in, he wouldn't let them go because he would start pouring tea for them. So that was his thing. Like I think that's one of the things I miss. It was no easy feat deciding to start a baking business. Miriam had other things to fall back on, including a degree in early childhood education. But as a mother of three, she wanted flexibility and independence. So she became an entrepreneur and named her business after the dolls Russia's famous for. That's when I decided that it's gonna be Matryoshka's Bakery. Like, it didn't take too long to decide the name because I'm a mother with three kids and it represents my country and I loved Matryoshka's. With macarons, it's my creation. You know, I just, we just think of something, like we'll think of, oh, I have an idea and we just go with idea, you know, where I don't have to like follow precise um, orders. Over time, she expanded, catering macarons for other businesses in the area, including Brio Coffee Works, Lunig's Bistro, and Shelburne Vineyard. Customers can buy her macarons at places like Good Times Cafe or on her website. Miriam has more plans for the future and hopes to open a new space with a bigger kitchen. But for now, she's continuing her experiments with new macaron flavors and is working on combining the qualities of Vermont into her delicacies. Мне очень нравится готовить макаронс. Это это мой маленький бизнес, и я очень горжусь. On a busy street in Winooski lies Golden Scissors, a hair salon owned and fully operated by Melissa Din. Nice to meet you again. I've Welcome been here to before. Golden Scissors. Have a seat in my chair. So, haircut? Yep. Here, Melissa is giving a classic clipper cut to a regular customer. Originally from Vietnam, Melissa went through years of hardship before coming to the U.S. She was born during a time of political conflict and faced a heavy amount of racism. Because when I grow up in Vietnam, in my generation, um, it, it was, you know, after the war, so the country was messed up. My, my dad is full African-American, my mom Vietnamese. So um, we got two, two big issues at that time in Vietnam. First, we from South, and the North win the battle at the Civil War. Second is my dad is African American. Any American doesn't have to be African American. White or black is the same. Long that you are American baby, you get harassed. Melissa says at the time, Vietnam was not welcoming to biracial citizens and ultimately her family decided it was time to go. After leaving Vietnam, Melissa and her family were sent to a refugee camp in the Philippines for six months. There, they were subjected to labor-intensive jobs such as cleaning the streets. And grow up in the small town and um, so, you know, low educated, so I don't know much about the world. I don't know what American is. I don't know any country besides, you know, the town that I grew up. But she would move to another town, Winooski, Vermont. With help from a refugee organization, Melissa and her family arrived in 1992. She was just 19. Although grateful to be in a new country, Vermont was not her first choice. From day one, I never bet, I, I never wanted to be in Vermont uh, because of the cold and the darkness in the winter time. You know, where I grow up, it's sun all year long, you know, sun and hot. Uh, what time are you talking about? Once settled, to keep receiving aid from the refugee program, yeah, yeah. Melissa had to find a job within six weeks. Not only did she do that, she also graduated high school and got her cosmetology license. While I'm in the school, the Axis Tech um, come up and introduce their program, 
And I like, oh, that's what I want, you know, I want to be hairdresser. Right, how old is she now? 13, she just turned 13. Oh, 13, huh? Melissa's training was going well, but her health was going in the opposite direction. The last 10 years, I come down with leukemia, stage 4 leukemia, so I don't think I can make it. So I pray, I believe in God, and I pray. And if His will let me live, um, and if God loves me and let me survive, um, because at that time my daughter only three years old too. Uh, I don't want my daughter to grow up with our mom and get harassed in a bill like I've been through. Uh, if he let me survive, I want um, to have my own business. And Melissa achieved just that. She opened Golden Scissors in 2017 and has thoroughly enjoyed being her own boss. I work very hard. I try my best. And I work hard so I get a lot of trophy. And uh, one of my trophy is uh, Golden Scissor. So I like, oh, I like that name. So I like, okay. So I named Golden Scissor. Her transition to America wasn't easy, but Melissa persevered and made a life in Vermont. She's excited at the prospect of expanding her space. I cannot predict the future. I cannot. I don't know what's going on tomorrow. Just enjoy it, this moment right now. <laughs> On the corner of East Allen Street and Abenaki Way in Winooski sits Morning Light Bakery. Egg tarts, taro bubble tea, and strawberry mochi are just some of the items you'll find on their menu. Inside the bakery, Ken Liu and his family are working hard, mixing drinks and baking their signature pastries. My name is Ken, and I am currently working um, at my parents' bakery just to help my parents out to make sure their business is successful. Originally from Hong Kong, Ken and his family moved to the U.S. when he was just 13. The biggest reason for the uh, immigration to the United States was that my parents believed a lot more opportunities uh, for our family uh, here in the United States. There are definitely a lot of opportunities, I would say. One thing I like the most about Vermont is that um, I would say people are more connected to each other than it is out of state uh, in, uh, in the big cities area. Thank you very much. Customer interaction is definitely uh, one of my most interested uh, thing uh, in, in my job at the bakery. I don't re really consider my work at a bakery. It's more something that I enjoy a lot. The biggest transition uh, from Hong Kong to Vermont uh, would be the language because my home language uh, I speak in Cantonese. I was not sure that immigration really means like changing your entire life um, by moving to somewhere else that is totally different than where you were born. In 2019, Ken's family opened Morning Light. Although they didn't have experience running a bakery, they were inspired to open one like the ones they loved in Hong Kong. Before they know that they're immigrating here to uh, the United States, my parents took some classes in, um, in baking and uh, they learned how to bake um, Asian style uh, cakes, um, which are usually less sweeter side. They're more uh, usually made with whipped cream rather than um, like um, heavy uh, butter creams. Our type of baking uh, is not as common in here in the area. So we want to bring in uh, something different and something more diverse here. My parents weren't 100% English speaker. They did not have a lot of English uh, background when they were in Hong Kong. And they came here having to learn some conversational English. I would usually be the person that uh, deals with the communication. And this is in order to make sure uh, customers are understanding things well. When he's not working at the bakery, Ken is finishing college as a computer science major at the University of Vermont. So far, I do not have any um, plans on what's after college. I would say that I am very uh, interested into working locally. It can be working with my parents at the bakery, uh, which I am totally fine with, and I enjoy working here uh, because I can, uh, 
I get more chances to, to know more people and uh, to see customers uh, day to day. Despite a hectic balance between work, school, and personal time, Ken maintains a positive outlook. I'm pretty proud of myself uh, and my parents as well. I know my parents are, uh, they are a pair of really hard workers. I would say they are, they made a hundred points um, on being good parents. And he's glad they brought him to Vermont. But his path forward is uncertain. He does not know if he will continue to work with his family and help be their interpreter, or if he will use his college education to plot out another direction. A regular coconut bubble tea and a curry chicken bun and a vegetable steam bun. So it will be 1048 today. Thank you very much. For mine, it's not like that. It's like people were like, hey, how, even if they don't know you, hey, how you doing, you know? It's like people respect each other. And uh, my goal is to open a couple restaurants in everywhere. My dream is I have a big dream. I have a vision. And I'm sure I believe my, I'm confident. I believe my dreams. And the dreams always come true. My dream is to be able to go to a bigger production where I have a bigger team and we can, you know, where we can we'll be able to ship maybe, you know. My dream is to get bigger, to let other uh, states to know about Matryoshka's Bakery and the macarons. For the last 10 years, um, the leukemia kind of changed my uh, perspective. Um, the weather, the people, it doesn't bother me anymore. Um, long that I live, long that I get up and not in the hospital bed, I'm happy. I enjoy uh, doing what I'm doing at the bakery, like getting to know customers and uh, they usually show support and that's something that I'm, I would probably not see if they're only treating us as um, that like customer business relationship. I think uh, my experience is not uh, very different from uh, most journalists uh, practicing in the game the last 22 years. Uh, it's been a horrendous experience doing our job. Practicing journalism under uh, the APRC, AFPRC and APRC government was extremely very difficult. The former president thought um, journalists were out to get him and because of the past happenings activities, journalists felt that this country, this, this government was definitely not friendly would want to kill them. So the, it was a very difficult balancing game. There were so many obstacles, uh, legal, economic, but also to some extent social obstacles. Remember, some, most of the laws that uh, you know, Jame actually implemented were even here during the First Republic. And the First Republic, even though it was seen to be a democracy, didn't do any comprehensive reform of laws to reflect the, you know, democracy that people say it was. But when Jame came, it became even more terrible because Jame started amending these laws, you know, broadening the definitions, expanding, I mean, anything that can be expanded and even coming up with stiffer penalties and, and then actually prosecuting people. We had to censor what uh, we're saying or what we are writing. If you have to talk about politics, it has to be about the president is the nicest man in the Gambia or he's the best person since sliced bread. Even in the last government, we had press freedom. But then you had freedom before expression, not freedom after expression. They said that sedition as it applies to the president is unconstitutional in the sense that when you say anything seditious about the person of the president, they can come after you. But when you say anything about the government, they can, no one can come after you. So they applied in law what they call a test of severance and, you know, um, divided essentially into two. 
The one that says government, they said, okay, you can criticize the government. Nothing serious about that. But when you criticize the president, then there might be some problems. And the governments we are left where we are subjected to illegal detention, frequent arrest, and intimidation. Remember, the Gambian law says that you know, you know, the accused is um, innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. But then it was a vice versa in that era. Um, you are guilty until proven innocent. Uh, during Jamie's regime, I was arrested many times. The first one was in 1995 when I wrote a story called Revolt at Mile 2. So at that time, uh, the military just took over and they were not happy about my story. I must disclose my source or they will jail me or kill me. I was uh, arrested in this country. I was uh, taken to the notorious Mile 2, uh, to the notorious NIA headquarters for almost 22 days, you know, for simply, you know, expressing my views or exercising my journalistic career. When a, lo a lot of journalists, including myself, had to leave the country and live in exile in the U.S., anybody sent me a text message they could be arrested, and there was somebody who was killed because the government thought that he was giving me information, which actually never happened. We're scared to write what is right, so this is the reason why I decided to you know, live for the UK in search for safety. Hydera was my childhood, childhood friend. We did everything together. We started work first at Radio City, a fir the first commercial radio in Africa. He had a, f a famous column called Good Morning, Mr. President. He used to criticize the president. He used to give him ideas and everything, and the president was not happy at all. On the 14th December, two days before uh, he was killed, uh, uh, the draconian laws was enacted. He represents the people. He represents the voiceless. He represents Gambia, I can say, because what he was doing, he was trying to avoid somebody abusing Gambia. He was killed to silence him. The time government thought if he was killed, the people will close. If I, those who accuse me of human rights violations, <laughs> well, I leave them to the Almighty Allah. Because of his death, I had to sacrifice my whole life to start fighting for him. And that's what I did. I went to France and I stayed five years. Five years that we achieved a lot with Reporters Sans Frontières and also a lot of other organizations like Amnesty and etc. We managed to um, do a lot of sensitization about Gambia, exposing the then regime, how brutal um, he was against the major and not only the major but the citizenry itself and also the fact that Gambia is being more isolated from the rest of the world. Many people even suggested to me, why, why not run away and leave the business? But since I believe in press freedom, since I believe democracy, good governance, I said I must continue the struggle. Fortunately for us now, there is a change of government and uh, since two years ago, we are able to speak our mind. We don't really have no censorship right now unless if people want to censure, them, them, censure themselves to be in the good books of the government. When you see the kind of crowd that was out in Jamela, you know that actually people are now free to express themselves. And, and this is something that has come to stay. No government can actually take us back to those days. So when I came back, I was doing similar shows and then the same topic, nothing happens to me. I say, aha, now our people need to be aware because an informed society is always an active society. So there is a severe dearth, a lack of um, the right people to do this job. And you know, journalism, like any profession, you need professionals to do it, good people. Without the good people, without um, people who are enthused enough, you will not have any good journalism. Even if you have the 
freer space to operate within. When at that level you have like the smart brains making those smart decisions to wanting to become journalists, but only changing afterwards, then there is something fundamentally wrong with the journalism environment. And one of those things that were wrong was because the space was constricted. And not only the children or the people coming out of schools, but even their parents were not encouraging them to come to join journalism. Now that the environment is free, you will still have a lot of smart people coming out of schools and joining journalism. You will still have a lot of investment in journalism. And with investment, the standards will go up. We've not been having that in the past. In the past, you couldn't even invest in the media because it was very dangerous. Now we have the wealthiest people coming and investing in the media. That's quite amazing. Strong institutions, educated electorate, informed electorate. We are not entitled to that. We are training our journalists to go out there and make sure that we have that kind of an electorate. This new Gambia, I think with the press, people can be more informed and at the same time educated and also sensitized, you know. And all this is really important to a new start, like democratization, and bringing people together. I mean, some of us who have been able to live through these horrific experiences are now living witnesses, an ample testimony of perseverance that you know, we went through as, as, as journalists in, in, in the Gambia. We are trying to use the profession in a positive way to kind of uh, make sure that we verify information and take that information out depending on how it is. But we are not here to appease the government and we would never try to do that and we would not encourage censorship, but we would do our best. Teach the people what is corruption, who is involved in corruption. And then once they know that, now we know the problem. And once you know the problem, then you can start to look for solutions. Not to say that we are now in freedom, we should write anything that we want to. We should be responsible, we should be credible. We, we are a source of information, so we should be reliable. I feel that there will be some healthy competition, and out of that competition, the best of us will emerge. And we may actually see the best of journalism um, we've ever seen in this country since we attained independence. So if it goes like this, we will see more newspapers, more television networks, more radios, and more trained journalists. So the future of Gambian journalism is going to be, going to be great. I'm glad that we are back and uh, we're free. Vermont Public, partnering with local filmmakers to bring you stories made here. For more, visit vermontpublic.org.